Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us on another episode of Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah and I'm here with my dad, Pastor Craig Roders. Hey. Today we have a very special guest who is an author, teacher, and he also has a podcast. He's written 37 books and he is a pastor at Bridgeway Church in Oklahoma. It's my honor to welcome Pastor Sam Storms. Sam, thanks so much for joining us today. It's good to be with you. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah. I know it's hard. I was like wanting to call you Pastor Dr. Sam Storms, <laughs> but I love that you just like just going Sam. By Sam. But yeah. um, that's we... my name. I, that's what I respond to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So we're gonna pray before we get started. So, Dad, would you like to yeah. pray? Father, I thank you so much for this day, and I thank you for Pastor Sam mm -hmm. making the time for us. And I just pray that you'll bless this conversation. Direct it, Lord, as your word says, whatever commit to the Lord, it shall be established. We pray your perfect and holy will be done. We ask that you guide us. We pray that you would really help us to answer questions that uh, sometimes we, uh, we answer questions that the church is not asking, but we pray you'll really help us to answer questions the church is concerned about, like tongues and the balance and uh, charismatic uh, and Calvinist and Arminianism. And uh, we just ask that you would just guide this conversation, bless our conversation, and thanks again for Sam. And I pray that as he blesses and refreshes many people through this podcast, we pray that he himself would be refreshed mm -hmm. and bless him and his church. And we thank yes. you for him. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right. So we like to encourage our guests that this is a conversation. So we're going to have Sam talk, but then we're going to be, you know, jumping in, asking <laughs> some questions and sharing. So... The first question we have for you, Sam, is your background and who are you and what do you do? Besides being a pastor and <laughs> well, an author. And yeah, that, that's a big door to walk I know. through. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I was raised Southern Baptist. I was uh, raised in a Christian family. So I, I never really knew a time when I didn't know Jesus, but I'm sure there was. But uh, saved very young. Um, went to the University of Oklahoma. Uh, went to Dallas Theological Seminary after that. Um, and Dallas, um, I don't know if they're this strong against uh, miraculous gifts now as they were when I was there, but when I was there, they were very strongly cessationist. So that's what I was raised in. <clears throat> it was a um, kind of an opposition to the things of the Spirit. Um, I was in a, a couple of Bible churches up until... Uh, I went to Kansas City in 1993 and was part of a vineyard church mm -hmm. and uh, became friends uh, with somebody that has ministered to you, Craig, uh, John Wimber, um, taught at Wheaton College for four years, um, started and joined God Ministries in 2004, traveled all over the world and wrote books, and then came to Bridgeway Church here in Oklahoma City in 2008. So I'm coming up on the end of my 13th year here oh. and... Uh, uh, my my journey through uh, churches and denominations and schools is one thing. My theological and spiritual journey is another one um, that is quite uh, interesting. You probably want to pursue that a little bit. But just to give you a brief synopsis, uh, I was what you would call an Arminian cessationist. Um, uh, I, I didn't really have words for it back then, but um, I did not like anything having to do with the sovereignty of God or divine election and very much opposed to the gifts of the Spirit. Um, my, my shift from an Arminian to a more Calvinistic view happened uh, when I got to Dallas Seminary. Mm -hmm. um, I was greatly influenced by a man named S. Lewis Johnson, who was professor of New Testament there for many, many years. And um, my view on spiritual gifts didn't really change until about 1987, 1988. So I'd been in ministry for about 15 years and had a massive uh, reorientation, looked at the arguments that I had been given while I was in seminary, uh, realized that I just couldn't find biblical justification for them. Mm -hmm. And to my everlasting shame, and I, I've acknowledged this and repented of it, I never bothered to actually open the Bible to see if what my professors told me was true. Mm -hmm. Just out of respect for them, I just said, well, sure, if you believe that, why shouldn't yeah, I? Yeah. And um, came to understand the reality of spiritual gifts. So that was in about 1988. So from 88 to the present, um, what is that, uh, like 21, 33 years now, I've uh, been operating um, in the gifts of the Spirit. Um, and um, it's just been life-changing, transforming. 
have a very high view. Of course, when people ask me if I'm a Calvinist, I always stop and say, define the term and I'll tell you yeah, if I'm exactly. one because yeah. there's so Everything's many such a hybrid today. Yeah, you notice how I mean everyone's yeah. such it's not simple like 30 years ago everyone's like I'm this yeah. like uh, you, it, Joshua yeah, Lewis a, says I just have a, obviously a very high high view of God's sovereignty and yeah. salvation and his yeah. providential orchestration over all events in the world um, so I have just a very high view of uh, the uh, preeminence and the priority of God's grace yeah. uh, in salvation and then obviously I'm very, you know, people say, well, are you charismatic? I say, I don't know, define the term and I'll tell you if I'm one, <laughs> because they have this image in their mind of sometimes, uh, what they mean by it is, uh, uh, health and wealth gospel or mm-hmm. certain forms of word of faith or the image of a guy on TV doing a, you know, some rather manipulative and, um, unbiblical things that really bring reproach on the name of Jesus. So I say, if that's what you mean by charismatic, I ain't one. No. Yes. I, but I am, uh, I believe very strongly in the validity of all spiritual gifts today. Um, I had my first experience with tongues in 1970. It was renewed in my life again in 1990. Uh, it's very much a part of my daily experience now. Um, we operate in all the gifts of the Spirit here at Bridgeway. And I just, what about, uh, what about seven, eight months ago? Uh, my final book, I think, on spiritual gifts was released. It's called Understanding Spiritual Gifts, A yeah, Comprehensive good Guide. Good book. It's a big one. It's yeah, about 360 or 370 pages. I know. That's why I haven't finished it. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a fast reader, but I've been reading it. Yeah. It's a great book. Yeah, yeah we love it. Yeah. So we wanted to ask you because, like you said, you have to define the terms. You know, People say, okay, I think you're crazy. They're either crazy charismatic or you can be – uh, Calvinists where they kind of say um, frozen chosen, you know, like all that stuff I've heard. I grew up going to a school that they were Calvinists and, you know, they, they were cessationists and all this stuff. And it just made me sad because a lot of the kids believe like I was chosen because my daddy told me so. So now mm. I can do whatever I, I want. Like the devil. And so that was really hard for me to understand. And they actually made you pick a side, like you had to either be Arminius or Calvinist. So we had to like mm-hmm. in debate class, like we had to pick one. And so I was like, well, I'm neither. I believe that the Bible talks about both. And so we were talking about how like Molinus kind of, I think we would be more a little bit. I know it's, but anyway, we wanted to ask you. I kind yeah, of let me just throw a little one bit. Up, I'm so sorry. There, Mar- yeah. I wrote a paper on it no, with no, my no. dad and I'm <laughs> Intense. And they wanted her to write a just, paper on it in fifth grade. So can you imagine <laughs> fifth graders trying to solve that? Yeah, so. it was intense. Well, I, let me just say one more thing. Um, oftentimes when people hear the word Calvinist, they think, oh, you don't believe in the power and the efficacy of prayer, and you don't believe you should evangelize the lost. Yeah. And I say, are you kidding me? <laughs> if that's what being a Calvinist is, then I'm not one. Yeah. I believe very fervently in the power of prayer, the absolute necessity of prayer, and the absolute necessity of preaching the gospel to the lost and um, any kind of uh, Calvinistic theology that would diminish those things is thoroughly unbiblical. So I'm, you know, so again, that's why I say, tell me what you mean by the word and I'll tell you if I am one. And it it is amazing, Sam, like you were saying how, um, you know, Calvinists, like you said, don't pray for the lost or they say that, but as well, like for me, what really kind of made me even in Baptist Bible college kind of made me kind of resist Calvinism a little bit is right when I got saved, my best friend committed suicide. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. right when I just got the phone call that my friend had just killed himself on New Year's Eve, we were just coming back to school from break. And he said, well, it wasn't God's will for Glenn to be saved. Mm-hmm. And I just, I'm a new Christian. I was kind of a thug drug dealer so I before Christ and so I was like I don't know what you're saying but get out of my face or I'm going to punch you and uh yeah. and so it kind of gave me this really crazy and then then the devil attacked me with well it's your fault you got Glenn into drugs you got him in so you deserve to be in that casket and then so anyway but so it's amazing to me how you see that how it kind of things shape us how we kind of view things like sovereignty versus mm-hmm. free will and uh, that kind of made me kind of go whoa because it just seemed I think you had mentioned a video about how I think you're talking uh, question how they how Calvinists can be so harsh you know what I mean their babies going right. out for the glory and so can you maybe unpack how you find yeah. that balance because you seem like a very uh, gent you know your Cal your Calvinist sovereignty but yet you <laughs> see like you you said we need to be gentle and not so harsh yeah. I heard you once say yeah well yeah um, again it, this would get as far a field of what we want to do in our time together but we we'd have to again define our yeah. terms. 
What do you mean by free will? What do you mean by sovereignty? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, these these things have to be defined, and I think people have. They say, well, if you don't believe in free will, I guess you mean that we're all puppets mm-hmm. and we don't uh, we're not morally accountable. Or you believe in sovereignty, I guess that means that God is the uh, author of evil. Mm-hmm. And so, and you know, people are wanting to be saved, and God's saying, "Sorry, I didn't choose you. Uh, you're out of luck." I mean, these sorts of misconceptions and distortions are are really bad. It, I, I can only attribute my the perspective that I feel like I embrace in a biblical way today to really being tied to Scripture, Amen. immersed in the Word of God, allowing scriptural categories to shape how I think. Uh, allowing scriptural commandments to shape how I live. Um, I mean, you look at look at the Apostle Paul. I, I say this to people all the time. The the man who said, "I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all," wrote the Book of Romans. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Amen. You know, Amen. Romans said, whoa, whoa, that that, that ain't possible. <laughs> how how can how can somebody who's so uh, much in in the you know who would prophesy, who would pray for the sick, who would Uh, speak in tongues, who would implement word of knowledge, who would perform miracles, wrote Romans 9 about the sovereignty of divine election and and the end of Romans 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. So I really try, I I really think that if we were all together, I mean the whole body of Christ committed to rooting ourselves and our beliefs and our definitions in the word of God and then very lovingly and patiently working with one another uh, to understand what each person is saying, we'd be in much better shape. I think part of the problem is, we're, as you all know, we live in such a reactionary, polarizing society, mm-hmm. and not just society, it's whole, the Christian society. Yeah. And if you differ with me on any doctrine, even if it's a secondary issue, that means you're a heretic <laughs> and you're not saved, and I am. Yeah. Um, and, and that kind of mentality is just, it's tearing the body of Christ yeah. apart. And uh, it grieves me, and I just I'm committed to, to what we call the convergence of word and spirit, mm-hmm. uh, to embracing both because that's what the Bible does. Amen. 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 Yeah, that's what we're saying. Is it seems like that more Cal? I, you correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like more people that are open to the gifts tend to be more in the Arminian slant. Would you Would you concur? That's true. Yeah, and because and like I had someone from the Vineyard because we're Calvary and Vineyard kind of broke out of Calvary. If you remember, but it's like Calvary funny. Broke out of I mean, yeah. What Calvary broke out of Vineyard, right? No, Vineyard broke out of Calvary. Oh, yeah, yeah. So anyways, yeah. but yeah. it was funny is this guy, this one person from Vineyard came to our church. He goes, the problem with you Calvary people is you're too bound by the word. Hmm. And I go, well, well, the word good. is Jesus. That's kind of a good thing to be bound. I said, there's a lot of liberty, I think. But yet I like the guardrails of Jesus, you know. But anyways, so what say you, why is it tend to be, in your opinion, why do most charismatics, not all, of course, you're the yeah. exception, yeah. but why do most tend to be more on the Arminian slant and you think of more Baptists or cessationists, more Baptists? What is that? Can you unpack that for us? That is a really fascinating issue. Um, I actually wrote a book called Convergence, mm-hmm. uh, subtitled Spiritual Journeys of a Charismatic Calvinist. <laughs> um and uh, it's out of print, although I have copies. If people want it, they can contact me and mm-hmm. purchase yeah. them from me. But I talk about it there, about some of the underlying issues that that result in that. Um, I think one of them is that um, the kind of the charismatic Pentecostal world was initially, at least in the 20th century, kind of fell within the domain of the Assemblies mm-hmm. of God yeah. and other classical Pentecostal denominations. Yeah. And they were always they were always more Wesleyan, more Arminian in their approach to the issues of salvation. Um, and I think one reason is is because they are a little bit more experience oriented, mm-hmm. and they um, they have very high view of the of the necessity of prayer. They are they live in constant fear that we're going to say or do something that. Um, that might diminish our zeal for evangelism mm-hmm. and our concern for the lost. And I think on the Calvinistic side, Calvinism is a very, um, it's a very complex, cerebral approach to Scripture. In other words, Calvinists just tend to be people who love doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. They love, I hate to say this, they love a good fight, too. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, this is true. Yeah. true. Yeah. And, and so they tend to be more... Um, 
you know, you, you look at them and you say, all right, um, the Arminian goes to church looking for an encounter with mm-hmm. God. The Calvinist goes to church just wanting to understand him better. Yeah. Um, and they're driven by these these kind of divergent passions, which I think need to converge. I think we have to have them both. I want to encounter God. I want to experience him. But I also want to understand him mm-hmm. and I want to worship him appropriately. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there are a lot of factors. Um, oftentimes, believe it or not, I don't want to kind of veer off of you know scripture here, but oftentimes it's issues of personality. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there are people who are simply wired to be more theologically rigorous, and others are wired to be more emotional and affectionate and in touch with their feelings. And they tend to just uh, they, they tend to kind of diverge on that point. And the 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 more uh, cerebral, theologically minded are drawn to the kind of the rigors of Calvinistic theology and those of the more emotional, affectionate orientation are drawn to the zeal and the outreach and the uh, kind of the relational approach to Christianity that you find among more Arminians. Yeah. So you're saying that, that's, Calvinists, a, that's a deep subject. Yeah. Calvinists are more smart based. <laughs> Arminians are more kind of goofy. I'm just <laughs> kidding. I'm just no. kidding. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. No. You know, that's the crazy thing. No. I Some of my Arminian friends are among the greatest scholars yeah. in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my very good friends is Craig Keener, mm-hmm. uh, who has... Craig is um, Arminian, and he is uh, uh, charismatic, and he's probably one of the top two or three New Testament scholars in the evangelical world today. Uh, And then I have Calvinistic friends um, like John Piper and Wayne Grudem, um, who are incredibly, and Greg Allison, another professor at Southern Seminary, these men are committed to the things of the Spirit. So, um, I love to see the convergence of the two. I see it in a lot of my close friends. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes the divisions and the kind of the we put people in these categories, and then, and then we and, and we don't allow the, re, the the kind of the cross breeding, the cross pollinization yeah, between the two, which we really need. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I was going to ask you how did you make it through. Dallas Theological Seminary <laughs> and be a charismatic because, like I told you off camera, I, I wasn't then. Okay, oh, well I've told you, but oh, I, I was a I was a hardcore cynical cessationist yeah. all during my seminary yeah. days because they taught. I mean, I told you I had a, a teacher. I don't know who he was, but in '82, teach me that it's either demonic or made up, tongues. and uh, tongues was, and so and and pretty much against the gifts. Yeah. And so, how you know to kind of answer maybe that question, and also how you're finding that balance of yeah. trying to have people that are really doctrinally based, but also want to experience the true God of the Bible, right? Because there is experience in Christ, but yet we don't want it to be all crazy as we're going to talk later about going into extreme, like the Mm -hmm. Toronto blessing and all that, which you probably dealt with being a a vineyard person. Mm -hmm. And so how it gets where, you know, uh, and I'll just kind of maybe see it without saying too much, but like I was Baptist, got filled with spirit, um, uh, you know, believe in the gifts. And then all of a sudden, the Toronto Blessing hit in 93-ish, I think it was 93. And all of a sudden, people are doing crazy stuff. And then when I'm kind of trying to decently in order, you know, 1 Corinthians 14, they say, you're quenching the spirit, brother. Mm. And I go, it's a spirit, but I don't think this is the Holy Spirit. (laughs) And, you know, just, you know, you you know all that stuff. And then I asked, I asked Randy Clark, you know, face-to-face, who was a Baptist Mm. at one time, and I said, how much of this is flesh because he's kind of the founder of the Toronto or help bring that. And he says 80, mm-hmm. this is just like three or four years ago, 85% of it, what, 27 years later is flesh. He said out of his own mouth. And he said, I go after 27 years, you only have 85% flesh <laughs> and only 15% spirit. I go, I hate to be a cynical, but that's like pretty bad odds. I'd like it the other way around. Right. I mean, cause you know, whenever you open yeah. yourself up, the gifts are going to be the emotionality or the feelings sure. where you have to. So can you, un- I don't know what question I asked, but <laughs> can you unpack that balance uh, of uh, what you're experiencing at your church uh, with those two groups? Yeah. Uh, by the way, Randy's a good friend of mine. Oh, really? Um, cool. He's actually hosting a big, big conference here in Oklahoma city in August that I'll be going to. Yeah. Um, and he and I, it's interesting. He and I, uh, did a conference in the Netherlands, uh, two years ago. And as part of the conference, they sat us down and did an hour long interview saying, how did the two of you get along so well, given the fact that you're kind of in different theological yeah, camps? Exactly. Um, 
in that issue. Uh, so it, it was really good. It was very helpful. Um, well, I just let me just describe for you what happens in our church. I'm preaching through Romans right now, and the people will tell you it's rigorous. Mm-hmm. It is a verse by verse, line upon line, ex- expositional yeah. preaching. Yeah. I tackle the tough doctrines. We talk about human depravity. We talk about justification. We talk about sovereignty of God. Um, all of these things. And when we finish, we what I we do here is I preach first, and then we have our time of worship and corporate singing. Mm-hmm. And it's thirty minutes of highly energetic, intimate oftentimes very emotional, but rooted in li- lyrics that are biblical. We won't sing anything that isn't Amen. biblical, but we, we want to we stir up our affections for God. Um, you know, Peter, 1 Peter 1.8 talks about loving Jesus and rejoicing with joy inexpressible in Jesus. And so we want to create an atmosphere in which that can happen, not manipulated, not mm-hmm. man-made, but so the Holy Spirit can do that in and through us. And then after that, we have at least 15 minutes where we'll have some of our people who are gifted prophetically will come to the platform. They'll give words of knowledge. They'll prophesy. Uh, We have prayer teams, and we pray for the sick every Sunday. Um, We believe healing for today as well. So it, it is. People will walk into Bridgeway first time, and they will hear me preach. They'll go, wow, I, not because it's me, but they'll say, wow, you all really believe the Bible. You go and line up online. You're not going to put up with any nonsense. And they go, wow, this is this is where I want to go to church. And then we go into our time of worship and spiritual gifts. They go, oh. this place is nuts. <laughs> this is a three ring circus. How can you how can you preach the word yeah. of God and believe that in such a manner? Yeah. And then be so passionate, energetic, and expressive in your worship and your exercise of gifts. And then we have other people who come to Bridgeway, maybe for the first time, and they sit there through this 40-minute sermon. They're going, my goodness, this is places dead than a doorknob. And then the worship and the gifts begin to manifest. And they go, yeah. oh, yeah. I think I like this Amen. place. But how can... And they don't know how you can yeah. do both. Which is spirit and truth, <laughs> I right? I just simply yeah. say... Yes, I said it's because the Bible doesn't give us another option. Amen. And here's the here's the thing that's that's that really breaks my heart is that very few churches are actually committed to doing Amen. both. They'll say they believe in yeah. word and spirit. Um, but the fact of the matter is they eventually will fall off the road into a ditch on the left or the ditch yep. on the right because it's really Amen. hard to maintain that marriage, that wedding between yep. the two. It, it's our, our human nature is such that we don't like challenges like that. We want to be drawn to that which we identify with more. And I keep telling our staff all the time, I said, I just keep reminding you all, this is really hard. <laughs> Most Amen. churches give up yeah. and they just simply say, this isn't possible. Um, we're going we're gonna to offend half the people mm. all the time. And I say, yeah, we're an equal opportunity. But I always we'll say. offend <laughs> half great. of you. Half the other, yeah. and um, but I just keep saying God hasn't given us a, an option here. I mean, He's told us that we are to be both rooted in the Word, committed to truth, and to be totally open to the move of the Spirit, and to have not only our minds enlightened but our hearts yeah. inflamed for God. Yeah. Um, and I just don't. I don't want to be a part of anything in the Christian life that doesn't embrace both of those. You know, it's funny you say that because we're going through that right now. And it's like you said it so well. We have the people that are more Baptisty say the word, the word, the word, and they're afraid of us getting too charismatic. Yeah. And then we have people that come from like Assembly of God Church saying we're not charismatic enough. We're kind of and I always say, you know, here's like balance, and here's like Baptist, here's Pentecostal. We're kind of maybe kind of more. A, pe- a charismatic with a seatbelt, you know, because I've seen the the abuse in the Toronto. I saw the extreme, and so I wanna, I really wanna do it soundly, and don't want it to get out of control. Where we're now, we're so much liberty, we don't need to do things that are biblical, and that really kind of. But it's amazing how there's such a hybrid 
and I'm not sure if it's the same in your church, where I have people kind of saying, hey, don't get too crazy. But then I got people going, go for it, go crazy. And and it's really, like you said, it really is. And that's why too, right? I think it is a move of the spirit where the Holy Spirit, I love, I think it was Tozer that says men will go to one extreme or the other, but it's only the Holy Spirit that gives balance. And we need to really not just move in the gifts, but walk by the spirit so we not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know, he's the one that gives us that balance of spirit and truth. Amen. That's and, so true. And so the true. thing that I wanted to ask too is because I have a friend, she went to a master's <laughs> university and, you know, she was completely one of those Calvinists <laughs> you would talk about who was very like defensive and argumentative. And she said that she would say that it was based off of actually experience now that she going to our church it was funny i was teasing her i'm like you came to this church to this group people like me and saying like you can't be because we're talking to this other i don't know if you know felicia masonheimer but she is like kind of the balance she's charismatic but she also um understands like she's an apologist as a woman like she's a theologian mm-hmm. she studies the word but she kind of thought like people who are like us at calvary you know we go verse by verse she liked that, but the fact that we we're open to the gifts, she thought that we weren't as maybe smart or we didn't really care about <laughs> mm-hmm. the word. We kind of just took it for granted. And it, it made me sad because I'm like, well, that's not true. Like we really understand that we base everything we do like off the word of God, but we don't want to sure. just know him and love the word, which the word is God, but we want to love the God of the word. So we want to exactly. really love God. And, and so she said that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but she was saying she really thinks that a lot of people who are um, cessationists, they actually go based off experience too as well because mm. they've seen the abuses mm. and so they're scared. Like they yeah. themselves would rather play it safe. And I've heard people even say that. They'll say like, well, we don't want to. We would just rather not get into that. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, that really scares me because – I, I kind of want to hear your views on this. Is what my question is. Sorry, with the long way around. Like, <laughs> like I to always preach. do. That's all right. Oh, set of I'm questions. So we just preach. Okay. But quenching the spirit. Because I was reading your book, practicing the power, and you're talking about the five ways you can quench the spirit. Um, how would you say that though? Like being, well, define the terms Calvinist, but the sovereignty of God. Mm-hmm. We've heard you kind of mention with like yeah. quenching the spirit. But you're like, how God's can you gonna... quench a sovereign God? I heard yeah, you say. Yeah, but what <laughs> you had your five points. But what would you say to quenching the spirit? But also. I guess the sovereignty of God. Yeah, I want to. I want to just real quickly say something about uh, what your your comments there were very very insightful. Um, one of the things I when 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 my cessationist friends and those in the Calvinistic Reformed world push back, I say to them, "Where do you think we got this idea about spiritual gifts? You think we made it up? Yeah, just, you think we you know we had a in a basement? Let's, let's create, Let's create this uh, new ministry of the Holy Spirit that is not rooted in Scripture. And I said, look, it's because the Word of God commands us, earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Do not despise prophetic utterances. Um, We we believe and practice what we do because we believe that's what the Word of God commands us to do. So, uh, yeah, and again, the the other thing you mentioned, Mariah, I think is so true— most and, and cessationists don't like to hear this. Mm-hmm. They, they get kind of upset with me. But I say, look, uh, you claim that my theology is based on my experience. I said, it's not. But I said, your theology is based on your lack of experience. Yeah, that's true. Uh, wow. Because you haven't seen this. So it's true. because you haven't felt this. Or you've seen it, as you just mentioned, Mariah, and you've only seen bad examples. Yeah. Yeah. You saw somebody who, who did something in a manipulative, scandalous way brought reproach in the name of Jesus. It was offensive. And that's the only experience you've had. And you base your rejection of gifts on that experience. So to say that one group bases their views on experience, the other on scripture is just a false dichotomy. It just simply is true. Well, but getting back to the, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask you this based on that same thing, because it's so funny how uh, John MacArthur, who I'm sure you know and maybe friends with, but John, you know, kind of put you guys, right, Grit, Wade Grudem and uh, Piper and Pre- probably you, I didn't hear your name mentioned, but probably you is, is I can't believe these men are so learned, but yet they support such a crazy doctor. You know, I remember the strange, strange fire, fire thing. But then what's wild is 
he just years before that did an interview for Calvary saying uh, about Chuck Smith saying we really love uh, Calvary because it's it's to the Pentecostals they're Baptists and to the Baptists they're Pentecostal and I'm thinking well okay you said that so now how are we strange fire and we're a bunch of nut bars make it up you know doing things that are basically in a sense I guess demonic or evil I, so what how did you how well, do you I, deal I, with that I when think... you talk when you I know you love him as a brother but uh, you know sure. here. I'm thinking, how do you go to that extreme? Because I know even Piper and uh, Wayne kind of said, I know I heard and Piper Jeff say, Piper. whoa, I have to respectfully disagree with you on that. That's too far. You know yeah. what I mean? I might not like it. It might not go as far, but you can't say it's strange fire. Yeah. What? Yeah. I, I think the my own, own opinion is that the, the principal reason for MacArthur's stance has largely to do with two things. Number one. He's in Southern California (laughs) and there's a, I mean, don't anybody take offense if you're from Southern California, but that's, let's be honest. (laughs) Yeah. There's some really flaky things that come out of Southern California and that happen there. And then secondly, he takes from the very worst examples of the charismatic Pentecostal world. And he assumes that we all embrace those (laughs) same extreme views and you know, I, when I respond to my cessationist friends, I don't do it by pointing to the uh, oppressive legalism uh, in the Bible church movement mm-hmm. or the uh, spirit-quenching attitudes of many people in the Reformed cessationist churches uh, or the arrogance that sometimes we see evident in those who are more, more theologically driven. Yeah. But I think John, he takes, when you read his books, he cites examples that I think most thinking charismatics would say, well, yeah, I agree with you about that, but that's not what we believe. That's not what we do. But he kind of paints with the organization. And it's this idea, well, if your belief in the spirit, uh, spiritual gifts and the work of the spirit today has the potential to produce this kind of fanaticism, then it must in and of itself be wicked, dangerous, and unbiblical. And, I could just as easily push back. I say that if your kind of cessationism produces this kind of arrogance and legalism, yeah. then it must be a bad yeah. fruit that or bad root that's producing bad fruit. Yeah. And both sides need to stop doing yeah. that. That is not the way Christians need to treat one another or dialogue with one another. That will not lead us to the truth. And, and you think um, you would see so, he would see you and Piper and Wayne Grudem as very sound theologians, Amen. but yet, you know, that, that would sort of, but I mean, he, he does, no but that he would say that this. validates because you are sound theo- theologically, yeah. but yet you also have this experience done decently in order. And that well, you'd think he would kind of go, I got to really wrestle with that because how could my good Calvinist friends that are sound doctrinally believe in this experience of the gifts moving decently in order? You know what I mean? That that should bring him to, a, <laughs> to say, I mean, I might not be excited about it, but I have to believe. Yeah. Why would these men of God, who I respect and love, he, he would he would probably say, "I don't understand them. I don't know how they can do it." But they're only a handful, and I see so many more abuses of the crazy yeah. fruitcakes in the charismatic <laughs> subculture. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, John and Wayne and Sam um, are. Uh, are very much a minority and therefore don't have to take them really all that seriously Mm -hmm. because the mainstream charismatic world is nutsville. Mm -hmm. Uh, And of course I just don't believe that's true. I think mainstream charismatic Christians are Bible believing God exalting, um, wonderful Christian men and women. So, but again, it's, it's the internet has done it. TV has done it. Social media has done it where some of the more flaky and um, unbiblical uh, expressions of charismatic life have kind of taken, you know, you you won't find a news documentary done on our church, yeah, on a balanced church mm-hmm. yeah. or, or, or a church that really shows the convergence of word and spirit. They're going to, they're going to find the most outrageous example of charismatic extremism. That's what's going to draw viewers. That's what, that's what brings in the money. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So all of these things factor in, I think, to why somebody like John would take the view that he does. Um, but again, I, he's a brother in Christ and we'll have fun in eternity talking about this. And it's so funny how like, you know, even though we believe the gifts, how so many Calvary people really love, 
uh, John MacArthur because he goes through the Bible verse by verse. You know what I mean? Sure. And so we love him, but we just disagree. And that's where I really love from what little I know of you. But what I love is just your heart to be able to disagree respectfully, you know, with people or say, hey, I believe this and you don't. Like, you know, like I said, Randy Clark, it was kind of like I'm talking to him and I'm going, wow, how could you say that and not kind of go – Wait a sec. Eighty-five percent of my meeting is flesh. I'm going. You know, to me, I kind of. I guess I'm not as mature as you are, but I mean, I went. That's well, pretty messed I, I up. Think dude. Randy would say. Yeah. I think Randy would say the same thing that I would say, is that um, the fifteen percent of the real is worth putting up. Oh, that's what he said. Uh, that's what he said. Yeah. Because I don't want to quench. I don't want to quench right. it by by hindering. Even though there's a lot of flesh, I want. Like you said, to give move to the fifteen, where well, I, you know, I remember, you know, John Wimber was famous for saying this, and it was true to his experience when he first his first years in ministry in the vineyard. Um, he said we prayed for hundreds yeah. and hundreds of people, and no one got healed. And finally, after a couple of years, that lady, right? they got yeah. one. That lady, that was John's way of putting it. We got yeah. one. Yeah. And and his 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 comment many times. I heard him say this. He said, I would rather pray for 100 people and and endure the fact that 99 didn't get healed for the sake of the one that did, rather than not pray for any of them and nobody gets yeah. healed. Yeah. Now, not everybody can embrace that perspective. Yeah. I do. I would rather pray for 1,000 people and only 10 of them get healed and deal with the anguish and the frustration of the 990 that didn't yeah. than to say, well, I'm just not going to pray at all. Uh, at least I'm just going to do the most without any expectations of healing, and none of them get healed um, at all. I, so anytime you you, you, um, you you deal with the work of the Spirit through broken human beings, there's going to be a lot of brokenness, yeah. a lot of human flesh, a lot of uh, fabrication. I'm willing to put up with that. I'm, I tell our people, if you aren't willing to put up with the mess, um, then you're not going to have the reality. It's yeah. just that's just the way it is with broken human beings. See, yeah, that was the thing for me. It's like, yeah, that that part cuz you know, we pray for people to be healed and a lot of people my wife right now is going through cancer and we're praying and believing God for her. We've been we battled this about 4 years she was healed and then it came back and uh so we believe that my thing just kind of I mean, I don't know, but my thing was the barking, you know, the Toronto back in the 93. That's what I kind of my experience was that I was kind of the assistant pastor, so I was the dog catcher. You know, I'm the one who had to go heal. You know, but I mean, there would be the barking. There'd be then this guy, you know, barked and roaring, you know, all that. And then all of a sudden, I said to this guy, he lifted his leg like a dog to pee on the speaker, and I said, "Whoa, bro, are you going? That's too much." You know, no, no. And he said, "He goes, you're quenching the spirit, brother." And I go, "What about decently in order?" And so, so my thing isn't the. I don't have a problem with the healing and not happening. My thing is, when how do you, uh, Pastor Sam, how do you go well, where you want sure. the liberty of the spirit, but when it gets out of control, like barking or yeah. lifting your leg sure. to piano speaker, that? how do you do that without quenching where we go, let's just throw out the baby with the bathwater? Sure. So what say you on that? That's a great question. Mm-hmm. Um, my experience with Toronto, and you may have a different opinion, but I do believe it was a genuine outpouring of the Spirit, mm. but I think it was one that was poorly pastored. Mm. Now, John and Carol are not. I know them. I love them. They're, they love the Lord. I differed with how they handled the, ma- the, the, the outpouring of the Spirit. John and Carol, their attitude was basically kind of what you just expressed. They were so terrified of quenching the Spirit. Mm. They saw this as such a holy movement of God how dare we put our hands on it and and make a mess of it and try to control it? And I just think that was a bad mm. approach. I think it was bad pastoral stewardship. Um, and what happened was once you refuse to put parameters or boundaries on expressions and manifestations of the Spirit, everything happens. Mm. Anything goes. And, and the bottom line was, I don't know if you ever visited Toronto during that I time. Know. I was there in uh, the spring of 95. And it, whenever there is real power, the spirit really moves in a season of revival, you're going to draw broken people. Mm-hmm. You're going to draw droves of people who are hungry for attention and who are will do anything and imitate anybody else if they can just somehow 
maybe move on God to touch them. And what happened was uh, Toronto just drew a lot of weak, broken, needy people who were ill-taught, who weren't rooted in the word, and they found a forum of freedom in which they could give expression to their to their their impulses, which led to a lot of these animal sounds and animal behaviors. And here was the mistake, I think, that the leadership of Toronto made. They tried to theologize the manifestations. Mm-hmm. In other words, they said, oh, you're moving in this way, you're manifesting in that way, that must mean this. And they tried to find biblical mm-hmm. analogies for it. Uh, or, you know, you're roaring like a lion. Well, yeah, you know, the Judah. lion of the tribe yeah. of Judah. Or uh, you're flapping your wings like an eagle. Well, you know, the eagle is the symbol of the church or whatever. And so they tried to theologize and give biblical categories to all of these manifestations. And that that is what I think really created the problem, because then everybody felt justified in just giving vent to whatever they were feeling, whatever impulse, whatever expression. Um, and it just it got. It got unruly. It got disorderly. Uh, the focus came off of Christ and the gospel and was put on people and their experience. And I, I just think, I think it was unfortunate. I, you know, I look back, my theological hero was Jonathan Edwards in the 18th century. And when you look at how Edwards handled those kinds of manifestations, it's a totally different approach. Uh, they had the same kinds of physiological displays Almost, they don't know if they had animal sounds, but they had laughter. Mm. They had people falling into trances. Um, Edwards, uh, you know, he said something, or maybe I summarized him. Basically, said, "I don't care if if you fall down. I just want to know: Are you different once you get back (laughs) up?" That's good. Do you love Jesus more? Do you love His Word more? Do you love His people more? Do you love the church more? Are you committed more to the truth of the gospel? So Edwards said, "We can't draw any conclusions about physical." There's n- unless we have explicit biblical statements, we can't draw a conclusion. Now, was now, it the Holy Spirit that caused you to do that? Maybe, yeah. but it might have been your flesh. Yeah. We just don't know apart from any explicit biblical guidelines. Now, do you need, I mean, so I, I'm not sure if I'm hearing you exactly right, but are you saying, because you're a theologian, right? I mean, so like Wimber, when remember the thing with Lonnie Frisbee, the Mother's Day thing where the tongue, so he went back yep. and studied all night and found out the Quakers, and I think he said Jonathan Edwards, but he studied it to say, I've got to get some history from this. I can't just have this experience because remember his half his church right. was freaked out. So do you need to, so you are you saying you don't need that because like what freaked me out is i i don't know who it was again i'm not real good with names but it was someone from toronto blessing it was i don't know if it's or not but they came here back right when it, so it was about 95 right after it happened and the a wife of whoever one of these leaders gave a prophetic word the word i bared witness with it people say i kind of move in the prophetic and i just bared witness with the word but the manifestation was she was shaking her head violently and everyone was like that's stacy campbell can't say yeah, thank you that sounds familiar and so yeah. i'm just like whoa yeah. wes and stacy i know them i know them okay. well so yeah. i went whoa I, like this right and so then i so i was respectful i'm a pastor so i'm like going okay so why the word you know streams in the desert there's words ready to pour the spirit da, 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 here in tucson and then I said, "What? What's the shaking? Is it like God saying I'm I'm disgusted by your resistance to spirit? I mean, what is that?" And she goes, "I don't know." And I go, "You've been doing this I, a year. So what say you on that? Because because as a pastor, I got to be honest. I, I guess I'm a Baptist right now because I'm kind of going, whoa, whoa. I need some I need some place in the well, Bible like Peter, you know, Joel two twenty eight. I need something. How what what do you do with that as a pastor? Yeah. Two things. Number one, I try to get to know the individual. Mm-hmm. Uh, are they self-serving mm. egomaniacs who are just trying to draw attention to themselves or do they really love Jesus mm. and they want to see the spirit move in power and change people's lives? Mm. Wes and Stacy are wonderful Christians. I know them well. Um, I don't doubt their motivation at all. Uh, the, so the second question then is, do we have any biblical categories to account for why she did that when she prophesied? And the answer is no. Well, she, she cited mean, the Quakers. She said the Quakers did that. That's, that's what she said. Yeah, but that's that's an historical yeah, yeah, precedent. Exactly, it's exactly, not a biblical exactly. precedent. That's what I said. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and I would just simply say, um, when people say, Sam, is she doing that because the Spirit of God is causing her to do it? Or is that 
some her just her own flesh, her own emotional display? Yeah. And my answer is, I don't know. <laughs> and I don't know that she knows. And I don't know that we can know because the Bible doesn't tell us. That was Edward's point. He said, does the Bible give us uh, specific explanations for certain physical phenomena? If it does, then we can draw firm conclusions. If it doesn't, we're left with, might be the spirit, might not be the spirit. Hmm. It, but Edward's point was, how, how, how does it change you? Yeah. Are you different? Are yeah. you a more mature, Christ-exalting, Christ-like man or woman? That for him was the criterion, the fruit of the spirit. Amen. You test the reality of the gifts and the manifestations by the fruit that it bears. And if it doesn't produce humility and a servant attitude and Christ-like transformation, then it probably was your own flesh, your own desire for attention. Um, so those are the ways in which I approach that sort of thing. So that, I, I so that I doesn't try... bother you. So that being a theologian and being a doctor in theology, that you've learned to just say, I give some liberty to that as long as I see I, I, the fruit of the Spirit I, afterwards. I do, unless I have reason to doubt the character and the motivation yeah. of the individual or if I see that it doesn't bear good, solid spiritual fruit, and, and, um, I, I, I just don't feel like I have justification for dogmatically saying that can't be God mm. or that must be God. Amen. Unless if the Bible doesn't yeah. tell me, I'm not going to say. Yeah. It's wild that I, I realized talking to you, I feel more Baptist than I, I realized because I'm a little bit, as a Calvary, we've got to have something for it. we got to have a biblical reference for everything. But it's funny, you say that about balance of the fruit, because the other way, like Mariah was saying earlier, how her school that was hard, you know, pretty hardcore Calvinist, how they would be saying, hey, I've got my Calvinist card, I can live like the devil, which you would say, yeah. whoa, 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 Calvin said, you're chosen to be holy. Amen. So I mean, hey, right. if, you're, if you're truly a Calvinist, believe the sovereignty of God, you believe the spirit of God is right, without holiness, no one shall see the One Lord. The and that's, friends, that's so. the, you know, so it's both ways in both camps. I mean, right, we want the fruit of the Absolutely. spirit in both camps, not just the charismatics have to name everything, but I, you know, and I think you would agree that you resist that of someone saying, I got my get out of jail card. I'm chosen so I can live like the devil and live in the flesh. No way. If you have the spirit the person of God who and says you... that very likely isn't born again. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I, I go back, I, I emphasize over and over again. Uh, when I started this series in Romans, in Romans one five, where Paul talks about the obedience of faith. Yeah. If you've got genuine, Christ-exalting, born-again, justified by faith alone faith, that will produce progressive obedience. It doesn't mean that we don't sin. It doesn't mean that we don't backslide on occasion. But that will not be the general orientation of our lives. So, yeah, the fruit of the Spirit, the, the obedience that flows from genuine faith has to be present. Amen. Amen. And I love that because I see that, like, talking about the school that I went to. And that's why I... We didn't get to the question I was talking about, which is totally fine, but it was about quenching the spirit. So First Thessalonians five nineteen through twenty two, it says, right. "Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast mm -hmm. to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil." And that part is the part that they weren't seeing is that we can't despise. We are not supposed to despise prophecy because it is to edify and build mm -hmm. up the church. And I also like what you brought up, Jonathan Edwards, because I was literally just last night, I'm trying to finish this book that you had, and it oh. was with Sarah Edwards. And I was like thinking that yeah. was so cool because I've been praying for that same thing. And because I really wanted to read this book because I've always struggled with like, you know, because we did kind of not grow up like that, but my dad, he always apologized. He's like, I'm so sorry because we, we did grow up like very, very much. I was so thankful how my parents raised me. Like we were we made sure that um, you understood that you have to um, judge yourselves rightly or you'll be judged. Like you need to make sure that you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Like I would hear these verses and my dad would always, he apologized like a couple years ago. He's like, Raya, why are you like scared that like you're not saved? He's like, are you in any blatant sin or doing anything? <laughs> and I was like, no, because there was a point though where there was some sin that I wasn't confessing and it wasn't anything big to like the world standards because like we weren't allowed. I'm like, even if I was allowed to do anything, my dad, we didn't, weren't given the opportunity. So people <laughs> thought like our family is so strict. I'm thankful for it now. And especially the fact that I'm in full-time ministry and I wouldn't have been without that. And like, I believe God called me to do this. But anyway, mm. I really think it was cool because I've been really like, it was my dad who actually pulled me out of that Calvinist school. And 
he had me hear the voice of God. Like he explained to me that the point isn't all like us raising you and like you can't do this and you can't do that. You're not supposed to be alone with the opposite sex. Like you shouldn't like we don't we give up the right to drink and like all that stuff. That's just how we do things. And I'm thankful for that. And I didn't understand that as a kid. But now when my dad, he really explained to us how important it is to hear the voice of God, to experience his presence. And Mm -hmm. and that's what I've been crying out for. And that's what we've been crying out for as a church. Like Mm -hmm. people get confused with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They think this is a weird thing. Like that means you have to speak in tongues and all this stuff. But it was just cool because like seeing um, you kind of summarize Sarah Edwards and her experience and there's a lot of people who are like saying, oh, that's weird and stuff. But and then her husband, right, he tested it. And I just I'm going to read what he said, but it says now if such things as Sarah experienced our enthusiasm and then that's his word for emotionalism and the offspring of a distempered, uh, distempered brain. Let my brain be possessed with ever more the, of the happy distemper. If this be distraction, I pray, God, that the, wor- the worlds of mankind may all be seized with this benign, meek, beneficent. Um, oh, my goodness. I can't even say this word. Glorious <laughs> distraction. No. I'm, like, freaking out right now. No. It's, like, echoing. Mm. But I think Beneficent, that, yeah. <laughs> I think it's just, like, what I was just shocked with is, like, I think we just judge things so fast to be like that's not god Hmm. but seeing like you said the experience like me it wasn't until my dad taught me how to hear the voice of god and go alone like literally would go in the desert for hours and it was until god spoke to me john 3 16 and i didn't even want to open it because i knew that i knew that verse and i was like this is stupid so i opened it up and then it was that then that i was just overwhelmed with the presence of god And it was so overwhelming. I was just crying and just realizing like God died for me specifically and he loves me. And I just was always thinking like he loves the whole world. He loves everyone. But until I could really understand that and even like you talk about Romans 9 and reading it and understand that he like that shouldn't make you like, oh, I'm chosen so I can do whatever I want. Like it should be something where you're so thankful and grateful that now what you want to do is give them your life and service. Absolutely. And so that's, again, me just going the long way around <laughs> everything and not being able to read. Yeah. But this is no, what people are talking right. about, the charismatics who yeah. aren't smart. And <laughs> <laughs> I just no, proved no. it. But no. I'm thankful for you and like your books. It as well as you did. That's beautiful. <laughs> By the way, that whole here. thing about quenching the spirit. Yeah. Um, it's interesting uh, that many in the reformed world struggle with that verse Mm -hmm. because they say, wait a minute, how can you prevent the spirit from doing something? He's sovereign. So Calvin's really bristle at that suggestion. Uh, How how can the spirit, how can you pour water on the spirit's fire? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, if he wants to do what he wants to do, he's going to do it. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, wait just a minute. Uh, You know, Paul said the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. Mm -hmm. Says that in 1 Corinthians 14. And here he's basically saying, look, Yes, the Spirit wants to operate as a fire in your midst, and you need to be careful that you don't put in place rules and regulations that aren't based in Scripture that will end up dousing His work and mm. and putting it out and hindering it. And then people say, well, if we're not supposed to quench the Spirit, I guess that means anything goes. No, says, here's the alternative to mm. quenching the Spirit, to not quenching the Spirit, judge everything, yeah. assess it. it, weigh it evaluate it. Look at it in the light of scripture. When you see what is happening is good, embrace it. When it's bad, it's evil, reject it. Yeah, that's good. Amen. Amen. Hey, can you can share with us a little right bit? Right yeah, right. I'd like to hear your just, I don't know, it's a big question, but just how yeah, I know you wrote a paper uh, remembering John Wimber, but I really liked that. I'd probably be our, our uh, I'd probably be a vineyard guy if I, mm-hmm. if he was still alive. I like Calvary because it's a little more balanced. And I tried to get with vineyard, but it seemed like they didn't like me. But anyway, but is what what could you share about your experience with John Wimber mm-hmm. since I think he was he really was like you in the sense where he really brought some theological solid base to the charismatic yep. movement and yet did the stuff as you said as well as he said but you quoted what 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 did you learn from John Wimber and was he kind of instrumental in you becoming kind of moving the gifts again I think you said you you met him in 88 or something no, um, I embraced the gifts in about 88. I met John in January of 91. Oh, wow. 
um, and had numerous encounters with him. We had him in Kansas City on several occasions. We went we went to Anaheim on several occasions. Um, and I, I, I re- John was a unique individual. Um, he had a remarkable what I call street smarts. Mm. He was a wise man. He understood the ways of the world, not in the sense that he followed them, although at one time in his life he did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, he, he was under, a worldly just, guy, right, for a while. Yeah, he had, some, he had some profound wisdom in just dealing with human nature and human beings. But John was, uh, John was uh, I don't know if I want to say John was a Calvinist, but he was very high on the sovereignty of God in, um, in his understanding of salvation. Um, and he was, um, he was the kind of individual who, again, wasn't afraid of the messes, mm. Um, but was willing to clean them up when they happened. Mm. Uh, he wouldn't. He wouldn't allow things to just kind of run amok. Uh, he would always try to bring in biblical parameters. Uh, constantly open to to what the Spirit of God was doing. He was just a. He was just a great guy. I loved John. Um, I just it grieves my heart so much that he died so young. Um, I remember going to. I went to his uh, funeral service in uh, November of '97. And um, it was an amazing time just to see those there who had been influenced by him. Um, but, yeah, he was a remarkable man. Um, he, he did help me a lot just in, in moving me uh, deeper into both the word and the spirit. Um, but I had pretty much I had pretty much uh, I'd pretty much bought the farm before I met John. <laughs> okay. yeah. he, he just he just taught me how to tend the animals. So. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. yeah. All right. So. Do you have any other questions? Yeah, the, for well, you? the number five, did you want to do? You can say it. All right. So, as a reform guy, you love to study that. I think we already answered some of this about mm-hmm. God's Word, but you also love the gifts of the Spirit. So, uh, we talked about this, but I'd like to maybe, if you can say some more, Closing but where uh, John 4 24, God is Spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in Spirit and Truth. Amen. And like you said, I think we can humbly say, uh, with the exception maybe of your church, that isn't, there's not too many churches like that in no. America that I know of. Like I said, I always say to our staff, not be braggadocious but i said if we stopped we only have extreme baptists or or pentecostal charismatic there isn't very many like you're trying to wrestle with the word solid doctrine but yet open to the spirit and so how you know if you want to say anything more on that because i really think Uh, that's what i love that's what i really respect from what little i know of you i just love how you're a calvinist but yet you're very gracious and merciful and loving. Like you said, you, you, you know, you're bold in your belief, but yet you're very tolerant because I don't know what Randy, you know, Randy's probably Calvinist because he was Baptist, but, but yeah, no, he's you, not. Oh, he's not. Okay. So it's no. like, but you can agree to disagree with so many people. And I really, that's really refreshing to me yeah. where I kind of got the, you know, your friends going to hell. It wasn't God's will. You know, and I was off of my teacher that the way Cal, that the way God picks you is like when people rebelled, when Napoleon's army rebelled and he tapped every fourth man who would have to die. And he said, that's how duck. And so I go, as a baby Christian, I go, so you're saying it's duck, duck, goose. That's how we get saved. Like, you know, you save, no, save, no, not saved. You not. Know, I'm going, I don't know about that. That just seems so hard, you know, but you know, yeah. they'll say, well, God can do whatever he wants. And I'm like, well, but he's a loving God, you know? So anyway, I would say, first of all, I, I, I do not want it to sound as if I think Bridgeway is, um, altogether unique and there's none like us. That's not true. Um, I am, I am increasingly encouraged by the number of pastors that I come across or who email me or call me, um, who are laboring to accomplish the same thing, this convergence of word and spirit. Uh, some are doing it more successfully than others, but they, there are a lot out there who are really committed to this. Some do it better than others, but, uh, it's encouraging to me to see that many are finally saying, look, I'm not going to live in the either or. I want the both Amen. and. Um, in my book, uh, Convergence, I have three chapters in which I analyze very deeply and in great detail the characteristics of word churches and spirit churches and what is going on in their mindset and their presuppositions and their worldview and their expectations that cause them to gravitate to one of those two extremes all with a view saying, all right, now, why can't we bring these together? Why can't we see that it's a both and, and that charismatics don't have to look at the word people and say, oh, you're just a bunch of Pharisees. Yeah. And the Pharisees don't have to look at the charismatics and say, Nuts. you're just a bunch of fanatics. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And 
Um, so that's what I try to do in that book. And I, um, so that was the way I tried to address that issue. It's, and I think a lot of found it very helpful. So I'd be happy to send you a oh, copy. Well, yeah. You just give me your address. Um, also, do you, can you, cause I'm, I'd like to have you come speak if you ever come speak at a church because I really want that balance. Is there any conferences you do that could kind of like where you talk about this kind of stuff or you could you can recommend? Yeah, well, we uh, we we launched a conference ministry here back in 2017 called Convergence. Oh, cool. And and just so you know, if you'll go to convergenceconferences.com, um, all of the talks are there in video and audio. Um, so the first conference, um, it was, the speakers were me, Jack Deere, Francis Chan, Matt Chandler. Um, the, uh, this, the, so we did it, it was a national conference here in Oklahoma city, had about 2000 people cool. in 2018, we did a smaller conference in our church building called convergence equip. And the whole thing was devoted to the prophetic. And all of those are videos and audios and, and the notes are all available on our website. And then in 2019, we did the national conference again. And the speakers at that one were me, Jack Deere, Matt Chandler, Michael Brown, and Christine Kane. Mm-hmm. And it was an incredible, incredible time. All of those videos, all those audios are there. And of course, then we were planning on doing one in 2020 and COVID mm-hmm. hit. And um, so we have kind of had to put on hold um, our approach to uh, what we can do in terms of conference ministry. We hope to relaunch again, um, probably not this year, but probably in 2022. Uh, So the Convergence Conference is one way in which we try to provide these resources to people and show them what Word and Spirit really looks like. That'd be awesome. I'd love to go to that. That's amazing. Um, so do you have any closing thoughts for us before we're going to ask you about some other, oh, wait, did you want to ask about Francis Chan? Were we gonna oh yeah. That? We're going to ask you if you could share it that we heard like Francis Chan oh, received. Cause the last time I heard him speak was at Ravi Zacharias's conference. And he says, I want the gifts. I'm around people with the gifts, but they yeah. prayed for me. I don't have it. But then we heard that you prayed with him and then he got the gift of tongues. Is that true? It is oh, true. Wow. <laughs> very cool. It's true. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, it was very interesting because um, I initially invited Francis to come to the conference in 2017, and he couldn't. And then the conference he was scheduled for got canceled. And so I called him back. I said, hey, will you come now? And so we just had a long phone conversation, and he talked about his desire to move in more power of the Spirit. I said, well, let me just pray for you right now. That's awesome. And yeah, he says that that's when it happened. And it wasn't just Francis. Uh, believe it or not, do you know who Max Lucado oh, yeah. is? Yeah. He's an old assembly guy, isn't he? Yeah. No, he was Church of Christ. Oh, Church of Christ. I thought he was assembly. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. No, he was Church of Christ. He's not now. His church is independent, but he was very a hardcore cessationist. Oh, wow. I did. I thought he was And I, I get a text, and he doesn't mind me telling the story because he's told it publicly. I get a text from him. And he introduced himself. He said, hey, Sam, this is Max Lucado. I got your phone number from a friend. So what you know, I read your book, The Language of Heaven, which is my book on tongues. And God has given me this gift. <laughs> and I thought, are you kidding wow. me? That's awesome. Because given the fact churches of Christ are not open yeah. to the gifts of the Spirit, I said, I, I told Max, I said, when you, can I use this language? When you come out of the closet <laughs> on this That's issue, right. what's, what's going to happen? Yeah. And it has, it shocked people when they heard this. And then about, oh, about two, three months later, I get another text from him. And I, and so I wrote him back. I said, Max, have you told your church yet? Have you <laughs> made this public? And it's a Saturday when we were texting. He says, well, that's kind of providential. I'm doing that tomorrow morning. Oh, wow. And so he yeah. did. And he was warmly received. The elders of his church were very affirming. He has a book on the Holy Spirit that's coming out, I think, in August He'll probably share the story of what happened to him. So, yeah, it it happens. Yeah, uh, and that didn't that, that happened also expect. to Bill Bright, I think. Bill Bright was kind of a Baptist boy, if I remember right, and then his wife got yeah. the gift. And, I had nothing to do with Bill Bright yeah, in that regard. But I remember. But, but it's really no, it's no. so neat when God just kind of invades <laughs> sovereignty and just says, uh, "I'm going to change your theology right now." <laughs> well, Francis, Francis is a graduate of Master yeah, Seminary. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And so they don't. Yeah, they're not real happy with Francis right now. <laughs> He's not going to be doing any conferences probably yeah, anytime soon. He's hanging out with me and my, and my tribe, and I think that makes them a little nervous. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Francis is a great brother. I love it dearly. Love yeah. And yeah. I love that you talk about we have 
we'll recommend your books afterwards at the end, but Language of Heaven and talking about that. And I also heard you talk about how you receive the gifts of, of the Spirit or receive tongues. And I just thought it was so cool because you're explaining to how now you do that every day. Like it's just part of yeah. your every day. And so my dad has been encouraging us because we, I think we started speaking in tongues when all my brothers and sisters, when we were like teenagers. And then I kind of was going to that school and I was afraid of that because I would, they, they would talk against that. And so then I was kind of freaked out, but then now using it more what, before I like prophesy or something, it really does even build me up. And even just when I don't know what to pray, like what's going on with my mom, like sometimes I'll just start speaking in tongues and it really does edify and build me up so much. Yep. And I just feel the presence of God, which a lot of people are like, well, I don't need that. That's good for you. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe you don't have the desire for it, but I really do. So we each have our own, but yeah. we would love to talk that in some other interview, but we know. But like, like you said, Sam, like, I mean, as a Baptist boy, what I heard, whatever, would, they, they were smart enough not to validate it. Like the one guy from Dallas said, it's demonic, it's, yeah. it's, it's made up. But m my school said it's the least of the gifts. And I was a baby Christian, so I, I said, I don't know if I have any gifts, so I'd like at least a least gift. you know. And then when you hear Paul, right, you said this great, as you joke, you say Calvinist, saying, I speak in tongues more than you all. I wish you I all. Why would God, why would Paul say that if it's such a worthless gift? I mean, you know, I mean, it yeah. just doesn't well, make sense. Well, nowhere in the New Testament does it say it's the least of the gifts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, re yeah. the reason people say that is because Paul said in the corporate meeting of the church, I would much rather you prophesy mm -hmm. because people understand. can understand exactly. what you're saying and therefore they can be built up. But then he says, unless somebody interprets and if somebody interprets a tongues, uh, somebody speaking in tongues, it becomes just as edifying and just as encouraging as prophecy. So he says in the corporate gathering, uninterpreted tongues are less important than prophecy. But if interpreted, they can become the functional equivalent of prophecy. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you one? I mean, if you have to go, I understand. But can I ask you one more question? Because I really think you can answer sure. this well. Um, I was told and I was taught by Calvary pastor that, you know, the Azusa Street kind of unleashed um, tongues in America, kind of, you know, it really got it. I mean, not that it wasn't before, but, you know, the assembly of God, like you said, and kind of everything with Seymour. But I was told that that's when, because if you look at commentators, before 1904 or whatever that was, that they never used the First Corinthians 13 of when the perfect comes to kind of say mm -hmm. that the word of God is the perfect. We don't need the gifts anymore yeah, just nice. to confirm the word of God. Um, that most scholars did not say that. They believed that was heaven, of course, with Jesus. What what do you say to people that say use that argument mm -hmm. of that yeah. the perfect is the word? We don't need the gifts today. They're not for today's cessationists. What what's your answer on that? In a short, <laughs> if you could do that <laughs> shortly. Sure. Yeah, it is a big subject. I have a, a, a lengthy discussion of that in my book, Understanding Spiritual Gifts. I also talk about it in the language of heaven, <clears throat> but it is very much a minority view um, at present um, that the perfect refers to the canon of Scripture. Yeah. Very much a minority view. Most scholars, even cessationist does, scholars, does Wimber, I mean, does, acknowledge uh, that the perfect— MacArthur believe that? Does he believe? Does he believe the perfect is the word? Um, he's one of the few that yeah. I think holds out yeah. that it refers to the canon of scripture. Yeah. But um, again, most most scholarly cessationists say, you know, no. For example, my good friend Tom Schreiner, who's a cessationist, teaches at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. He says. First Corinthians 13 is the strongest text for the continuation of the gifts in the present day that I know of in the New Testament. So the perfect there is very clearly the state of affairs brought about by the return of Christ uh, when we shall know even as we are known, we'll see face to face. Um, so there are very few who would use that passage to argue against the validity of the gifts. Uh, those who do just simply haven't studied the text very closely and like I said, I, I wish they would read my section on it in understanding spiritual gifts, and hopefully I'll be able to persuade them, I think, of what is the biblical perspective on that. Amen. And isn't Amen. it true, like, you realize here, here's someone like John MacArthur, so, so biblically literate, yet he can still miss it. You know, where Paul says, we know in part and prophesy, where none of us have perfect theology until we get to heaven, right? But it's I don't crazy. have it either. Yeah. I've so. The number of times I've had to repent and change my <laughs> mind and say, folks, I taught you incorrectly. Yeah. Let me bring... Uh, you know, let me repent and tell you what I really think the text is now saying. So that, I mean, if we can't do that, um, you know, if we have to live in some sort of 
um, you know, arrogant, uh, I don't want anybody to ever think I make a mistake kind of mentality, uh, that, that's destructive yeah. to the body of Christ. We have to be willing to acknowledge that we're all learning, we're all on a journey together. Amen. Amen. Especially as we operate in the gifts, we do want to be able to humble ourselves. And that's where we see the discerning of like seeing when someone is moving in the gifts and then they're very much so like, don't tell me what to do, you're quenching the spirit. That's scary, but yeah, that's pride. it's cool with what how God's been really doing a work in our church, and especially with the young people. And we're just like we want to humble ourselves. Like if we're wrong, someone please correct. Like subject, like prophets are subject to other prophets. Like we want to humble ourselves and say we don't have it right, but we we do want to move. Like who says that um, a ship that's moving is easier steered, steered than one standing, standing still? still. Yeah. Like we want to move and. Mm. But we can't just be so afraid where I've been in the past, like no. paralyzed perfectionists where I'm like, oh, I don't want to yeah. mess up. But mm -hmm. sometimes we're going to, we just have to be willing and get comfortable being humbled and mm -hmm. humbling ourselves. So And risk the ocean. Sure. Like I really like what you said, Sam, is that just how mm -hmm. we, we want to be sound doctrinally, but we also have to give room to mm -hmm. make a mistake. And that's where I would say humbly. Sure. I, as a Calvary guy, we almost get to the place where we're so afraid of messing up. We just never go mm -hmm. out. And that's my, f and, and if you know, Calvary, remember Wimber kind of broke off because they did stop yeah. moving. And I agree with that. I thoroughly agree with that. We're Baptocostals. We're more Baptist than Costal. And, you know, and we need to get back to the balance, like you're saying, teaching the word, sound doctrine, verse okay. by verse, with the liberty of the spirit, because it, Calvary used to be that way. And there's a reason why Wimber kind of broke off. I mean, because you're saying now we put the Holy Spirit in the closet and we need to find that balance. And that's, I always I have a hat that says old school Calvary because I want to be like how <laughs> Calvary was in the Jesus movie. You know, I mean, yeah. not to go back, but you know sure. what I mean? That real balance, which, you know, like you said, you know, not that there isn't any churches doing it, but I like to see, as you, I know, would like to see a lot more finding that, struggling right. through to find that balance, you know, because it is a struggle, right? I mean, because we're always going to tend to go word, like me, kind of, and afraid, and then you're going to go charismaniac, and we want to be <laughs> the balance. So, hey, would you pray sure. for us, Pastor Sam? Would you pray that we could find that balance and for the church and just because sure. I, really, sure. I really appreciate you. Thank you. Well, Father, I do thank you for Craig and Mariah and for all those who uh, minister in their church and that community. And I pray that you would give them such a deep, deep hunger to know the truth of scripture and a yearning in their hearts to experience the fullness of the spirit's power. And Lord, I pray you would guard them against ever thinking that they can't mm -hmm. do both, that they've got to choose. Yes, they've got to make a choice between one or the other. Lord, keep us from yes. that. Give us a hunger and a desire to embrace the fullness of all that you have revealed in Scripture and the fullness of the power of the supernatural work of the Spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we like to tell our listeners where they can find you. They have samstorms.org, correct? Sam Storms. Yes. And then also That's we have it. all your books. These are the books that I just decided to get myself Christmas presents this year. So <laughs> I got this one, The Singing God, uh, which this is the one I'm going through right now. Uh -huh. And then The Language of Heaven, which I have not read yet. And then Practicing the Power, which I have read parts of it. And me and my dad are going back and forth on this one. This is the yeah. one we like share yeah. and we like read parts and we're sharing this book. But this is Understanding Spiritual Gifts comprehensive guide do you know that there's a sequel to that now this available one? it's called spiritual understanding warfare. spiritual yeah, warfare no, a comprehensive guide yeah and so we yeah encourage did everyone you know to a guy did out. you know a guy who d did tom uh white? did you know tom tom white from corvallis oregon yeah. Oh, yeah. He was the guy. He, he delivered oh, yeah. me. That's how I also got more towards yeah. the gifts because oh. I was a Baptist struggling with deep oppression, and yet I was taught you can't be oppressed as a believer. <laughs> so then, but then when yeah. you're. I quote Tom White several times in the book on spiritual oh, wow. warfare. And uh, so, yeah. I mean, th if it wasn't for God using him, I might not be here today because I was so. I was, you know, into a lot of LSD. So I had a lot of demonic oppression, saw mm -hmm. faces. I thought I was just schizophrenic. I thought it was nuts. And then he yeah. prayed for me. By the grace of God, Halloween just night. totally. Yeah, Halloween night is really cool. So, uh, yeah, so that's neat you know him. Yeah. Oh, hey, do you ever, I would love to have you come speak sometime. Do you ever speak at little churches? We're not a huge church. We're about 150. Sure. Love to have you come and sure. learn Sure. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I haven't traveled much, obviously, yeah, during yeah, yeah. COVID. Well, I'm saying um, later. But um, just stay in touch with me. And if there's if we can work it out and if I can figure out a way to do it, I'd Definitely be happy to. Definitely love to come to your yeah. conference. When yeah. you do. do you think in 22 you'll hopefully get back into it? 
We hope yeah. so. We hope Hopefully so, King yeah. Biden will let us out by then and we can now get into joke. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Bless you, Sam. It's thank you pleasure. so much. Thanks for having me. It's been a good time. I've enjoyed this. Thank you so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you would like to listen to us, wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. You can also follow us on Instagram to see our behind the scenes at Calvary Conversations. Thank you so much to our sponsors, Mission Heating and Cooling. Please check out their website in the description below. Thanks so much, guys, and God bless.